Hi, how are you? Good. How's the conference so far? Good? Great. So I'm Maximiliano. You can see it's, um, I have a long name, right? Um, you have learned yesterday that we can do something with the name, like, for example, with accessibility. Remember that? That, so you can call me M90 if you want, okay? That will be fine. Or just Max. So um, let me try to explain what I'm going to talk you about right now. So we are going to talk about web performance and why this is so important. So let me first go really quickly uh, about myself. So I'm a mobile web developer. So I have been doing web development for a while since that browser. Okay, remember that one? Uh, I've been traveling a lot. This is my 60. Um, nine countries, so a lot of countries, okay? So mostly for conferences, trainings at companies. Uh, you can find content of my own on several publishers. I have also a couple of books, okay? And the last two books are about this topic, okay? So web performance. But I have two goals, and it's not to talk about myself. Um, my two goals are make you feel bad, okay? So that's the first goal. So uh, keep that in mind, and also show you new, new tricks, okay? Things that you can do right now for, for web performance. So let's start. I know you know, so because you are here, you are front-end developers or designers, and so I know that you know that your users are not happy, okay? And you are basically losing money, okay? So why is that? Because your web is slow. Your website, your web app is slow. So, and it's mostly a front-end responsibility that I know that you know that. You're not going to blame the server, okay, or DevOps or wherever. It, you might have issues there, but it's not really the common scenario. It's typically a front-end problem. So we need to take responsibility for the web performance. So, and also I know that you know that page load is not really important, so no one is currently measuring page load. So we are um, using some metrics that are user-centric, so such as first meaningful paint or first interactive, or even speed index. I'm not going to explain this right now because I'm pretty sure that you know that, right? Anyway, also, I'm pretty sure you know that there are some goals in the industry right now. You might have different goals, but at least please set up your goals, your performance goals, in terms of the, um, the seconds that you want these metrics uh, on your website, such as one to three seconds for first meaningful paint, or uh, two to four for first interactive, or speed index between two and three, or 2,000 and 3,000 if you're using milliseconds. So, and I also know that you're already doing a lot of stuff, such as optimizing the network transfer, just as checking if GCP is enabled for all your text-based uh, requests or responses, including JSON, for example. You're also working with TLS and HTTP2. I'm pretty sure you're doing that. So you're using CSS as appetizer. So as most appetizers, it should be a small, okay? And before the main meal, that's the whole idea. And you're using JavaScript as dessert, okay? So also small, okay? And at the end. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're doing this. And you're also optimizing images. This is plain, basic web performance optimization. I'm all, I also know that you are defining an HTTP cache policy, so that's really important. So stop Googling how to disable the HTTP cache, okay? So you need to make the HTTP cache your friend. And also, I know that you are using service workers, right? How many of you are using service workers right now? Okay, I should see more hands, maybe next year. So I know that you're already doing this, okay? This is not new. So uh, all the stuff that I've been covering so far, it's uh, basic web performance optimization tricks. So you must be doing this. So what's the problem? So why am I here? So right now, if you look at the stats, this is from HTTP Archive. Uh, this is from April. So in first contentful paint on the desktop, the median is 2.4 seconds, which is not so bad. And on the mobile, it's 5.8. And when, I'm, when we're talking about time to interactive, so basically at one point, the website or the web app, it's actually useful, okay? The median is 8.9 seconds. And I'm sure some of you might be thinking, well, that's, that's not bad, okay? It's around nine seconds, okay? It's not a big problem, okay? But do you know how long 
uh, is 8.9 seconds on the web. Let's see. I don't know why you're laughing. It's that. So when you're trying to access some content right now on a mobile device that is more than 50% of your users, that's the median time to actually use the content, the median, OK? So we have a problem, OK? So we need to do better. So that's we are all here listening uh, to web performance. So in fact, if we take only landings, so you will see it's 22 seconds, OK? That's a report from Google. That's a lot, 22 seconds. You know what 22 seconds is, so don't worry. I'm not going to do the, the same thing again. So, but when you look at other stats, if a page takes more than three seconds to load, more than half of the user will leave it. So we are in a problem, OK? And one of the biggest problems here is that we, as front-end developers or designers, we have been always underestimating the mobile space. Okay, so for example, right now we can say iOS and Android is pretty much the mobile space, yeah, 90 something percent, which is fine. But is that Safari and Chrome? Is that how it looks like? So when you look at the stats, I mean, more than 70 percent is Safari and Chrome, but we also have a lot of other browsers with actual market share that are even more important than IE. I still, I'm still seeing people caring about IE 11, for example, but not about these browsers with more than the IE market share. For example, the Samsung internet browser uh, is that one, okay? UC Web, Opera Mini, and that one that looks like Chrome, but that's Chrome on iOS. And Chrome on iOS is not actually Chrome, okay? So uh, have you ever tried your websites there? Are you measuring performance there? And I have even one more important browser here, that one. And you're thinking, hey, well, that's the old icon. Let's use the new one. So, that's not a browser. Well, actually, it is. It's called the Facebook mobile browser. And when you click on a Facebook post or ad, you, your, your website is being rendered inside Facebook. So have you ever tried your website there, how it looks like? What APIs do you have available there? Because that's not the same browser, the default browser that is running on your phone. Also, we are using cellular networks. And I'm sure you're thinking, well, we have 4G now. so. 5G is coming, we don't need to worry about performance. Well, let me give you some information here from 3.6 billion mobile internet users that we have uh, a couple of months ago, December. So um, only 60% are smartphones, okay, and 43% are in 4G. And how many of you are in 4G? Most of you, right? Which sounds good, but I'm pretty sure that you have seen this. So sometimes, a lot of, uh, on a lot of places, uh, you're not in 4G. You have a 4G phone, a 4G data plan. You're in a city with 4G coverage, but you are being downgraded to 3G. But when we are talking about 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, we are thinking about bandwidth, okay? About how big is uh, the pipe, okay, to send data. But when we are browsing the web, websites and web apps, that's not really so important. So it's more important to think about the latency. And here you can see the latency is pretty uh, big on 2G, and it's going smaller. 4G is really small. But when you compare 4G, so those lucky 4G users, with uh, a DSL at home, it's really big. So that's a problem that we still have in 4G. Remember, the latency or round trip time is the time that it takes for a TCP packet for the data to actually get to the destination. And for every resource that you add in your website page loading, you're adding the round trip time. So think about that. Okay, even on 4G, we have a problem, the latency. So we still have a big performance problem on the mobile web. And I'm not sure if you have heard about this. Have you ever heard about Chrome light pages? Ooh, only two or three. How many of you are on Android or Android users? Okay, a lot. So this uh, has arrived in Chrome 73 on Android, so most of you, okay? So if you enable Data Saver, so it's a, 
it's a settings that you can enable. And now if you install Chrome from the Play Store for the first time, you will see a dialog like that one saying, hey, do you want to enable a data saver? So if you enable that, and then a light page will be rendered if you are in a 2G network. You can say, well, that's not common, OK? That's not common, but there is an OR okay, operator there. And the OR operator says, if first content full paint estimation is greater than five seconds, Chrome will activate light pages. So that means even if you're in 4G or in Wi-Fi at home and you're visiting a website and Chrome estimates that that website will take more than five seconds to achieve first content full paint, it will activate light pages. What is light page? A light page is something that says light, OK? But uh, it's cloud-based render. So it's like some kind of Opera Mini, if you remember Opera Mini. So uh, it has some smart optimizations, whatever that means. And that includes, for example, not loading all the images. So you probably don't want that for your website. So think about this. A lot of Android users can now be seeing your website, if it's a slow, without images by default. And then the user has the option to load the images manually. Okay? So you don't want this. You want to basically reduce the, the probability of Chrome light pages. So you can try it. So um, you can go to Chrome Flags in your Chrome for Android browser, and you search for override effective connection type. You select 2G, and then you're not going to be browsing in 2G. It's not throttling the network. It's just changing the connection type, and so it will activate light pages. So you can actually try it on your Android. Also, we know that PWAs are a thing today. We have PWAs on desktop now, so you can install PWAs on iOS, on desktop, on Android. But I'm not sure if you know that right now you can have PWAs in the Play Store. So for example, I know that you know, I have been talking about this before. So um, for example, right now, if you go to trending in the Play Store, uh, there is one app, 1-800-Flowers, that is actually a PWA. So it's in the Play Store, but it's a PWA. It's not, a, it's not an Android native app. So, and what is important is using a technology known as Trusted Web Activity, TWA, and to use that technology, your content must achieve a performance score of 80 in Lighthouse, which means you must be fast. Okay? So, there are many reasons then why we need to achieve a really great performance. So we need to hack web performance. We need to do more. So I'm pretty sure you are doing everything that I've been covering so far, but we need more. So let's hack it. I'm going to start talking about the first load. So the first impression okay, is the most important one. So when the user is accessing your website for the first time. So I'm going to start talking about the round trip. Remember the latency that we have on cellular networks? We need to try, I mean, we can't change the latency, but now that we know the latency is there, we can try to do a lot of work to make our content more, let's say, compatible with, with that latency. So without getting too deep into TCP, probably you have heard this. So when you're sending a file over the internet, that file is split in several uh, smaller packets. Okay, so you can, you can send uh, different packets or, or the browser is going to receive different packets. So each TCP packet will have that latency. So we need to avoid more than one round trip to, to ask for more packets. So the problem is, how big are those packets? So that's, it's a difficult question to answer. So how big a TCP packet is, because it's something that uh, changes with time on the, that client-server relationship. But there is something that we know, and it's the first TCP packet. So the first TCP packet using something known as TCP slow start algorithm, um, that roughly means that on Linux-based servers, that are most of the servers right now, it's by default 14.6 KIV. And here, I will uh, open a parenthesis, and I have a warning for you. This is probably the only thing that you will remember from this conference, okay? So, that, remember that. KIV, what is that? Have you ever heard about that? In fact, how many bytes do we have in a kilobyte? 
it seems like a simple question, right? How many bytes in a kilobyte? Most of you will say 10 to 4, right? Well, I'm sorry to tell you that's wrong. Okay, it's a thousand. And if you don't believe me, okay, you can ask Siri, you can ask Google, you can ask Wikipedia. It's 1,000, I'm sorry to tell you this. So um, this has been for 20 years, by the way, so it's not new. So uh, we have something known as a Kiwi byte. Okay, the Kiwi byte is the one that uh, it's binary, so that's the one that is 1024. Okay, so one Kiwi byte, and that's the I there, is 1024. So when you want to be technically accurate, when you're saying something, you need to use these units. So, closing parenthesis. We need to avoid one, more than one round trip, okay? And on Linux-based uh, system, that's 14.6 Kiwi bytes. So, uh, the thing is, Seb, that means that if you are, your first HTTP response is usually the HTML. So, if you are sending an HTML of 15 Kiwi bytes, it won't fit in one TCP packet. So, you have a problem if you want to achieve the greatest performance. So you need to keep it in 14.6 kibibytes. But maybe you're thinking, that's not too much. Well, first, you are she zipping the content. So, so that's she zipped. So that's around 70 kibibytes, okay, or 70K of HTML, which might not be so bad. So that, um, also, we need to start thinking about this. When you're browsing a website, uh, we have something known as the above default content. That's what you see before scrolling, okay? And all the user-centric metrics are focused on that part only. So then we have below the fall content. So I'm sorry for Kyle, we love Kyle, okay? But for the user-centric metrics, Kyle is not important there, okay? So we need to focus on the um, above the fall. I'm sorry, Kyle. Right? But, um, so we need to focus there. So that means that if we can deliver only the ATF content, the above default content in 14.6 Kiwi bytes, we can achieve really great performance because it will fit in one TCP packet, okay? So that's the first tip. And we can embed all the CSS and JavaScript if you really need JavaScript, okay, for that. So you can embed that. So I'm talking about the style tag, not the link, not an external. We don't want another HTTP request with a round trip. So, um, and even if you have a space, you can embed your logo in SVG or a low resolution version of your logo, a very high compressed JPEG or something like that, okay, in Base64, directly in that HTML. So, another important thing is to avoid the HTTP to HTTP redirect. So, now we are moving everything to HTTPS, but when users are typing a URL, the browser is going to HTTP by default. Okay, and then when we are making a redirect. And that's basically a stop sign for performance. So because the browser needs to stop there and say, oh, no, it's not here. You actually need to go there. And the process starts again, and we are losing a lot of time. So um, I'm asking you to start using HSTS. This is um, a spec that lets you add a header into your first HTTP response saying, hey, browser, you know what? In this domain, we only speak secure connections. So from now on, you always need to go to HTTPS. And when you do that, then you can preload your website directly in that URL, and your browsers will add you in a whitelist. So next time another user that is a new user for you is trying to get to your content, then that user will go directly to HTTPS. And you can save around half a second. And half a second is a lot because we don't have uh, too much budget. We have a tiny, tight budget for performance. So that's for the initial load. Now let's talk about how to hack data transfer. That is also important because we have more things to send, not just the HTML. So let me um, mention quickly, quick, over HTTP. So this is an experimental uh, transport protocol over UDP, not CCP. Again, I'm not going to get too deep here. But um, it reduces the latency and connection messages that are needed to actually receive a content from the server. And it's using an HTTP2 interface with TLS. So it looks the same as we are doing right now. It's something you need to enable or add as an add-on in your server. And 
this is uh, the, 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 like the official diagram. This, this uh, protocol comes from Google. It's an open protocol. It's available on Chromium-based browsers. So the important part here is that when you are using Quick, okay, you need to look at that part of the diagram. So you have less connection messages. And if the connection is repeated, then it's zero latency. So there is no need for sending packets all over the network. So uh, Quick right now, it's improving performance on Google, on this reducing buff uh, buffering on YouTube. Facebook, for their native app, they're using a similar protocol based on Quick, and it's also improving performance. And according to a Google um, research, three quarters of all the requests on the web can be actually optimized thanks to Quick. Um, and by the way, this is officially uh, HTTP over Quick. That's the name if you want to Google that. And the most important part here is that this is the draft of HTTP 3. So this is becoming HTTP 3. So you can start using it right now, and then at one point you will upgrade this to the final version of the protocol. But you can start saving bytes today okay, for your users using it as Quick over HTTP. Then we have something known as Softly. So Softly is a new compression algorithm over GZIP that can save you data. So everything that you're GZIPing, you can actually um, use Softly for that. It's using most, more CPU, but CPU is not like a big issue right now. So you can start using it. And this is compatible with IE6, okay, if you, if you want to, to um, provide that content. But even more important, we have Broadly. It's, it's incredible how many servers are not broadly compatible yet today, because now every browser is broadly compatible. So broadly is a different compression system instead of GZIP, and you can set up to 25%. So remember the 14.6 kibibytes? Well, now we can fit more HTML in one TCP packet if we use broadly. It's around 80 K, OK? So you just check the encoding header. So if the browser is compatible, you're going to send a broadly package. If not, she zip. So check if your server or your CDN is supporting broadly. And if not, try to ask how to add it. So uh, LinkedIn has saved 4% uh, in load time. Facebook has also a lot of savings based if it's CSS or JavaScript. We're talking about text-based content. And now. Resource loading, because HTML is not alone, and it's not just about bytes. We are loading also a lot of resources. So we have new cache control. So for example, if you're using React, Vue, Angular, CLIs, it's common today to use hash in the file name. Okay? So when we are sending a Dutch bundle.js file or bundle.css file to the client, we know for sure, for sure that that URL will never change. So there is no need for a conditional request. There is no need for the browser to ask to the server, hey, I have a version of that file. Do you have a new one? There is no need for that, because if we change the content, if we build our app again and that file has changed, the whole URL will change because it's a different hash. So now we can specify that with a new modern cache control. Okay? It's cache control immutable. Okay? So if you say so, then the browser will not send a conditional request, which means you will save a lot of time when loading those files. Also, for those of you working with service workers, there is a new pattern available today that is pretty common that means that you serve a file from the cache, so it might be outdated because it's served from the cache, and also you update the content okay, in the background for later. Okay? Now you can specify that pattern to the browser. Okay? It's known as a stale wire revalidate, and it's currently available in Firefox and Chrome, and also because cache control lets you use multiple values, you can have a fallback anyway. So you can ask the browser to start using this pattern for the browser cache. So that's pretty cool. Something that um, is even more important is warming up engines. And for now, we have been talking about things that have to do with the server configuration, HTTP headers. But this is something that you can um, change in your HTML. So warming up engines. We need to help the browser to start processes as soon as possible. 
So because the DNS query can take up to 200 milliseconds on the 3G network, and the same for the TCP and TLS connection. And that's a lot of time. So we can announce DNS queries as soon as possible, okay, with a link, DNS prefetch, or we can say, hey, browser, you know what? Later, you will need to download a CSS or a font file from that other domain, so please start the DNS query right now. So also you can announce uh, TLS connections, like please start the TLS connection there directly. I'm talking about talking to the server, opening the connection to the server. Um, you can also use this, not just in the HTML, but also you can add it as an HTTP header. So even before the browser is actually parsing your HTML, the browser will know that it will need a connection to another server. Okay, it can be Google Fonts, for example, or a CDN, where you are downloading your important resources. Preloading, maybe you have, how many of you have heard about preload? Okay, just a few, like 10%. So it helps the browser prioritize resources for rendering. So in this case, you're not going to say start a TCP connection or a DNS query. You're going to say, hey, I want that file. I know that you don't know that you will need that file, but I know that, so please go and download that file. So you can say that to a CSS file, but also you can say that, for example, to the WAF file for web fonts. So, and you can increase a lot of perfor your performance metrics applying this if you're using web fonts, right? So, uh, and there are a couple of new things here. Now, when you're using preload, um, also in the IMG tag, you can specify the importance. So how important is that? So you can change the priorities, the default priorities in, in the browser using that importance attribute. So you can start using this right now. Another usual question that I get is to bundle or not to bundle, okay? So I'm writing JavaScript or CSS and okay, I have 100 files, should I bundle the files or not? So even on HTTP2, it might seem like an adding pattern because there is no need for, for doing this. We have better um, TCP connection usage and also we have uh, HTTP header compression. But it's not. It's still a good idea to do this, okay? So this is a tweet from Paul Irish saying that, you know what, basically, um, we still need to bundle. It's the best way to achieve the best performance with JavaScript and CSS. But I'm not saying bundle everything, okay? First, we need to do code splitting and just send what is important for the initial render, and then you can load the rest. Yesterday, there were some talks talking about, for example, um, dynamic hydration, if you're using React or other tools. So you still need to do that. But for all the files that are needed for the initial rendering, bundle that file. Okay, that's important because it will save a lot. Regarding web fonts, if, how many of you are using web, son, web fonts in your websites? Okay, so it's not a lot, which is good, right? So web fonts are really annoying because we have something known as flash of unstyled text. So that we see an image, we see the logo and no text because there is no font loaded. So you need to start using font display, optional swap. This is currently available on mostly every browser, which is good news. Right, because with this, you can specify what do you want to do if, for example, the user is in a 2G connection or is in roaming or has data saver enabled. Um, you know what? The phone is taking too much time to load. Well, swap it to another phone. Oh, this is optional. Don't try it. Don't even try it. Okay? Um, this is from last week on Google. Now with Google Phones, you can add an attribute when you are requesting the CSS from Google Phone, specifying your font display policy. So please do this. And then we have images. So we know how that images are really important, okay? A picture is worth a thousand words, but the problem is it needs to load, right? Because we, we know it doesn't work, okay? So now we have a lot of things that we can do. For example, we can preload responsive images. So if you have been using the picture element, okay, for, for responsive images, now you can do on the preload, the source set and sizes, so you can actually move all that uh, responsive logic to the preload, okay? So this is uh, pretty cool. 
Now, and this is also from news from Google I.O., you can do lazy image loading, okay, with loading lazy, just an attribute. So that is pretty simple, and basically it means that by default, when you say lazy, those images, the images below the fold will be loaded only when they are in the viewport, okay? So we are saving a lot of bandwidth, okay, thanks to this. And this is also available on iframes, which is pretty cool as well. Okay, so we can start focusing on the ATF content, and then we can start downloading the rest. So this is pretty cool. It's also time to replace standard JPEG and PNG file. I'm not talking about new formats. There are a lot of new formats coming, even WebP. But yeah, it's still tricky to get it, to get it uh, well done. But now we have new compression algorithm for PNG, like softly, and also for JPEG, Getsly. So these are new compression algorithms that we will, will push performance further on your current images without changing compatibility because this works on IE5 probably, okay? And the last part that I have for you is how to hack the user experience. So, um, and let me first talk about HTTP client hands. So, because this is really interesting and it's currently underused in the market. Um, the idea is the browser can expose data to the server you need to opt in through an HTTP header or a meta tag saying, you know what, browser, I want the next request that you're making to my server, I want to know more information about the client so I can increase the user experience. So you can ask for round trip time, latency, so you can actually know in your server how's the current latency and make decisions server side about the experience that you want to provide to that user. Downlink, that's our, um, basically bandwidth, an estimation of the bandwidth. Uh, esti uh, this is um, connection type, 2G, 3G, 4G, okay? Um, save data, so this is a Boolean flag that will tell you, you know what, the user has data saver enabled. DPR, device pixel radio, so density, pixel density, and view per width. And also, you can ask for device memory which is kind of cool because now you can know if it's a feature phone, okay, or, of, or if it's really a smartphone or a desktop computer and change, for example, the image file that you're sending. So, uh, and by the way, device memory, the API from the W3C, is sending you the actual device memory in MIB, and that's not many in black, okay? Now you have learned that's maybe bytes, okay? So, so now you know that, okay? Remember that. So. And that leads to something that is known as reactive web performance. So because typical web performance optimization works statically. So we analyze our website, we measure, and we apply some techniques, and that's all. Reactive web performance means that you can actually uh, know about the context with some, uh, several APIs, such as the network information API, uh, performance of servers. So this is a, a couple of APIs available where you can receive information about what's going on. Like, for example, if you have a script tag or if you have um, a function that is taking, it's, it's like using the thread more than 50 milliseconds and you can get information about that on that particular CPU, of course. The save data client hint, so you can actually know if the user has data saver enabled. And the device memory client hints. With all this information that you have from the context, you can actually make decisions, client side or server side, to deliver a consistent experience. Because maybe I'm on a, a Galaxy S10, okay, but I'm in roaming and I'm in 2G. So don't send me a Galaxy S10 experience. I want to see something. That's why Chrome is creating light pages, because it's better to see something than nothing. Okay, because if not, the user will just abandon your website or your web app. So in terms of the consistent experience, you can choose to load or not web fonts based on the previous information that we have been gathering, to change the service worker's cache policy, so make a change based on that. Uh, SSR versus clients are rendering, so we can change this based on the current context. Maybe the user is in a very low-end phone with bad connection, um, maybe uh, with low memory, maybe client surrender is not a good idea. And you can reduce the amount of loaded data to keep a consistent experience. Also, for example, even if it's a really high density phone, but the, the latency or the bandwidth is not good enough, just send a low resolution image, okay? And you, now you can get report from the browser. 
there is a reporting API, there is a header, report to, with a server endpoint. And basically, the browser will send you reports about problems, including if Chrome light pages are being activated on your site. So you can actually know this on your server right now. So we have been covering a lot, right? So we have seen why web performance is important and how to hack the first load, data transfer, resource loading, images, okay, and user experience. So remember, performance is top priority, really top priority. Push it always even more, okay? It's really, really a worthwhile effort, okay? Feeling bad enough? Yeah? Cool. Well, that's all. Thank you.